right, let's open up our Bibles, uh, going way back in the Old Testament to the book of Ruth. Last time we were together, we finished up that miserable book of the book of Judges. And so uh, this evening we begin here in Ruth chapter uh, one. Now, when you originally, initially read the book of Ruth, there doesn't really appear to be a, a lot of you know, spiritual stuff going on. I mean, what we're reading is kind of a, um, a love story, if you will. And yet, I think that particularly as we get into next time we get together in chapter two and we'll start looking at the typology that we find in the story, we'll see that it is a magnificently spiritual book. You know, the, the Bible's laid out in kind of an interesting way that first of all, you've got the book of Genesis. And of course, Genesis is a book of beginnings. And then you've got Exodus. And Exodus is a book of redemption. The Lord's redeeming his people out of Egypt, and of course, he's bringing them to himself. And then you have Leviticus. Leviticus is a book of worship. Now, how are the redeemed supposed to worship? Well, that's what Leviticus is all about. Then Numbers, it deals with the walk, the behavior, and as well as Deuteronomy, it deals with obedience. Obey God, obey God. You've been redeemed. You're, you're worshiping God. Now, walk with the Lord and, and please God with uh, your lifestyle. And then we come to Joshua, and Joshua is the redeemed um, taking a hold of what it is that God has for them, grabbing a hold of God's will for your life. What, is, what does the Lord have for you? What are the victories that God has for you? And you're stepping into the victories and the accomplishments that, that God has for you over the course of your life. And then you've got Judges. And it was a miserable study, wasn't it? It was just one horrible defeat after another. Then... When we finish up the book of Ruth, we're going to get into First and Second Samuel, and this is the book of the kingdom. And this is now where the house of David finally ascends to the throne, and, and the house of David ushers in uh, reform and renewal and breakthrough for the uh, children of Israel. So it's interesting that in between Judges and Samuel, or in between failure and the kingdom, we have this fascinating story of the book of Ruth and Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, which is one of the most magnificent types of Christ found anywhere in the Old Testament. Now, this would make then the book of Ruth the eighth book in the Bible. Now, the number eight is seen throughout the scripture for a number related to new beginning. Uh, the eighth day is the first day of a new week. There are eight beatitudes. Um, a child in uh, Israel is circumcised on the eighth day. There are eight guys that wrote the New Testament. God saved eight people on the ark. Jesus showed himself alive after the resurrection eight times. Jesus' name in the Greek, the numeric value of his name is 888. So it, it's a number that we find over and over again associated with a new beginning. And so now with the book of Ruth, God is doing something new. And again, what is the Old Testament? The Old Testament is the unveiling, it is the revealing of the Messiah. And we're going to see now an angle to the Messiah that really we haven't seen anywhere else in the Old Testament. So there's something new now that is being revealed. Warren Wearsby, he gives us this insight. He said, Ruth and Esther are the only two Old Testament uh, books named after women. Ruth was a Gentile, married a Jew. Esther was a Jew that married a Gentile. But God used both of them uh, to save the nation. Irving Jensen, he tells us this, the short story of Ruth is one of the beautiful love stories of the Bible. Boaz, a type of Christ the Redeemer, marries Ruth, a cursed, a person from a cursed race, by the way, a type of Christ church. And so chapter one now is kind of the setup on how all of this takes place. Now we're going to be told that all of this happened during the days of the judges. 
And the days of the judges were days of what? They were days of anarchy. There were days where every man was doing that which was right in his own eyes. Israel was a total and a complete mess. And so it's during these days now that we're introduced to a family. And I think what makes this so important for you and I is that God's people were living in days of lawlessness. We are living in days of lawlessness. There is lawlessness in every direction. How do we live in days of lawlessness? Now, in a couple of months, we've got Joe Dallas uh, coming and Joe's uh, latest book. We've had Joe here a couple of times. Joe's latest book is uh, Living in a Cancel Culture, Christians Living in a Cancel Culture, and he's going to be sharing with us how we live in this crazy age that we find ourselves in. What the book of Ruth does here in chapter one is that it tells us how not to live, on what not uh, to do. And um, as we live in these lawless days, I, I, read a, I read a news article, I think it was last Thursday or Friday, in Oakland, California. I don't know, maybe you saw the same news story. There's this young lady, she's historically been anti-police, you know, defund the cops. She's a social justice warrior. She's, she's leaving her bank, and she gets held up, and she's killed in, in the holdup. And now her family is begging the police department not to punish the people that killed their daughter. I'm think, that's pretty sick and twisted if you ask me. If you're going to continue to allow these lawless people to run in the streets, what in the world can we expect? So we're living in these insane days. How now should we live? Well, let's take a peek at what we read here. Notice in verse 1, we're told now, it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And there was a certain man of Bethlehem. Now notice, the last two stories that we had in the book of Judges dealt with Bethlehem. And now the book of Ruth is rooted in uh, the, the city of Bethlehem. Bethlehem was the ancestral home of David. David is about ready to be revealed. The king is about ready to be revealed. And so these last three stories leading up to First and Second Samuel all deal with the city of Bethlehem. And so this guy's living in Bethlehem, Judah. And notice he then went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his uh, two sons. So this is the setting. Israel is in rebellion against God. And what did the Lord say would happen? What was one of the last things that Moses told to Israel as he's getting ready to die and Israel's going to go into the promised land? He says, take heed to yourselves, lest your heart be deceived and you turn aside to serve other gods and worship them. Lest the Lord's anger be aroused against you. And he shut up the heavens so that there be no rain and the land yield no produce and you perish quickly from the good of the land which the Lord is giving you. So God warned them. You're going to go into this land that flows with milk and honey. Man, you guys are going to be so blessed. You're going to be enriched. It's going to be a wonderful thing. But... If you forgive, forget me, then what's going to happen is that famine is going to be coming your way. And so this is now what Israel is experiencing. Now, we got a guy. Now, this guy appears to have a godly heritage, as we're going to see here in just a moment. He decides that he's going to bug out, right? Now, he's going to, he's going to go to the land of Moab. Now, God had not called him to the land of Moab. He was an Israelite. God called him and his brothers and his sisters to possess uh, the land of Israel. But, but he comes up with a plan. And his plan is, notice, that we're going to go dwell there. Now that word in the Hebrew, it means to sojourn. It means to dwell for a time. So he gets his bug out bag and his family together. And he heads over now to the plains of Moab. And he's just going to hang out there. Now God hasn't called him there. There's, there's nothing in the narrative here that would indicate that God has spoken. 
right? No angel is appearing and saying, hey, go to the plain of Moab. Uh, we don't find the Lord coming to him in a dream. He doesn't pour out his alphabet soup and it spells, hey, go to Moab. There's nothing mysterious going on here. There's no supernatural going on here. This is a guy that's going to be, I'm going to beat the system. And this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to introduce a little bit of compromise into my life. I'm going to go where I'm not called uh, to be, but I'm just going to stay there for a very short period of time. Now, his name, in verse 2, we are told, is Elimelech. Elimelech. Wasn't that part of the lyrics from The Lion Sleeps Tonight? Elimelech. But anyway, his name means uh, God is king. All right, So he's raised by parents who obviously are, are people that were devoted to God. They're living at a time where every man was doing that which is right in his own eyes. And Israel had no king. And so now these parents have this little boy, and they say, God is king. And that's what we're going to name our kid. And so this is a man that should have known better. He should have stayed where God had him. So his plan was, he's just going to leave from Bethlehem. They're going to go, as you can see, just over the north part of the uh, Dead Sea. And they're going to go to that plain there of, uh, of Moab. We, we don't think of this as being a rich land, but it indeed is a very fertile part uh, of the world. This is what the plain of, of Moab looks like. And so they just go around the Dead Sea, and they're going to hang out there and be there for a while. Well, as with a lot of our plans, a lot of our carefully laid plans, they oftentimes don't turn out the way that we had hoped, particularly when they are plans of compromise. And so we read that Elimelech, Naomi's wife, that would be this woman in the story, died. And she is left. And her two sons, now they took wives of the women of Moab. And the name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other, and here we have it, is Ruth. And they dwelt there for about 10 years. So uh, this guy who was raised by a mom and a dad, God is king, God's king, and God's gonna, God, God's gonna take care of you, and God's gonna direct you, and God is powerful, and all of this. He decides, you know, I'm, I'm gonna get out of here while the getting's good. And we're gonna see that he liquidates all of his assets. And that, no doubt, is what he was saying. Hey, I'm gonna sell high, I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy low. All right, this is at the beginning now of this, of this famine, and so let's get rid of our farmland, and then uh, we're just gonna hang out over there at Moab, and then we're gonna come in and we'll swoop in uh, when the prices are, are low. But as we're gonna see, by the time Naomi comes back, she doesn't have two nickels to rub together. She is absolutely uh, broke here. So they've got these two sons. Now, uh, he, evidently, he dies young, doesn't he? His sons aren't, aren't of marrying age yet. And, um, and, and so uh, here he is. He, he's died now. And now his, uh, we, we read here that his, his sons, um, they end up uh, now uh, getting, getting married. And, you know, you wonder if one of the reasons why there wasn't compromise, and, and sometimes you'll, you'll see this, when we're living our life, and we're going through a rough patch, and we begin to think that God isn't trustworthy. And if God isn't trustworthy, why should I be afraid of compromise? Why should I uh, be afraid of uh, violating um, the, the word of God? But as we'll see, there are people that remained in that place of famine, and, and they were okay, and, and they survived. You know, a lot of times, we, we don't trust God uh, because, gee, if God was trustworthy, then my life should be a little bit better uh, than it is. So notice then, uh, it, the, the story turns darker here. Notice in verse 5 that both uh, Malon and uh, Chilion, this are two, her two sons, uh, they also died. And so the women uh, were survived. Uh, the woman was survived by her two sons, uh, survived her two sons and, and her husband. You, you can't imagine a more painful situation than that. I mean, your husband dies, and now all of a sudden you got your two uh, boys that have uh, died as well. And this, this is an example of where, of course, um, compromise is, is going to lead you. The, the only way to guarantee that you'll never die in a place of compromise is stop, stop compromising right now, 
right? If, the, if you've got compromise in your area right now, stop it. Turn away from that. Get away from that. And uh, that will guarantee that you won't die uh, in compromise. Now, obviously, there's something genetic, I think, going on with this family. I mean, uh, Elimelech, he, he died when his kids were pretty young. It's interesting what they uh, named uh, these two boys. Uh, Malia, uh, Malon uh, means a sickly, and Chilion uh, means wasting away. And so uh, they, they were probably, you know, underweight babies, if you will, pretty sickly. And uh, so uh, sickly and wasting away, uh, they die in that place of uh, compromise as, as well. Now, you look at this path of compromise that they took, and it's a very interesting one, isn't it? Um, we, well, if I can get this thing to work, so uh, I want it to work. Wait, there we go. All right. So you look at the path of compromise. The first thing that happens is that uh, they moved to uh, Moab. They weren't supposed to be there. And then notice, you end up marrying a Moab. You end up marrying a Moabite. And eventually then you experience misery in Moab. And some of you that have gone through long seasons of compromise, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Where, man, you thought that this thing was going to work out and this was going to happen, that was going to happen. And it just goes from uh, bad to worse. Now notice in verse 6, that, that she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return to the country of Moab, for she had heard that in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people uh, by giving them bread. Now notice, so she's, she's over there in Moab, and now word is reached, hey, they've got bread over there in Bethlehem. Bethlehem means the house of bread. They got bread in the house of bread over there, and so... There are people there. They've survived there. God's taken care of them. They didn't all die, so we're able to see that moving to Moab was totally unnecessary. It wasn't that somehow uh, this compromise saved their life. If they just would have stayed there, they certainly would have been far better off. But again, God uses it, and God works, and God is gracious. Now, this shows us that Naomi was a backslider, and she was not an apostate. Now, there's a difference between somebody who backslides and somebody who is an apostate. There is backsliding, and then there is apostasy. The Apostle Paul tells us that there is a great apostasy yet in our future. And we're not going to be caught up to be with Christ. We're not going to meet Christ in the air. That day is not going to happen until there is this great falling away that takes place. Now, a backslider is a person they will rationalize. They will find excuses for their choices. You know, we come up with a million and one choices, don't we? There's a million and one reasons on why we're not living the way that we know that we should live. And when we drift away from the Lord and we find ourselves in, you know, with a drug addiction or we find ourselves sleeping with our girlfriend or whatever the case might be, we've got all kinds of excuses on why we're, we're doing this. That's, that's a sign of backsliding. Now, an apostate is one one that repudiates his faith. An apostate is one who says, look, I don't care. I don't care what your dumb book says. I don't care what the rules of the book say. I have no interest at all. I don't believe in Christ anymore. I don't believe in the Bible anymore. Get away from me. Now, it's interesting that a backslider returns, but an apostate is lost forever. Let me give you two great examples. We've got Peter and Judas. What's the difference? They both denied the Lord. They both fell into great sin. What was the difference? Peter had a backsliding heart, but Judas had an apostate heart, and that is why the Lord Jesus Christ said it would have been better had that guy never, ever been born. So Naomi is returning. Now let's notice as she returns, verse 14, you know, because she tells him, hey, you guys go away. You, you, go, you, go, you go find uh, husbands. And so they lifted up their, uh, their voices and they wept again. And Orpah, 
she kissed her mother-in-law and no doubt departed. And then Ruth, though, notice, isn't it interesting that she clung uh, to her? So she says to these two daughter-in-laws, look, you know, I'm not going to have any more sons. You don't need to stay by my side. You go home. Go back to your family. You're going to find some people that, uh, you know, are going to take care of you. And you'll, you'll find guys and you'll end up, you'll end up uh, getting married. And so Orpah... Uh, she says goodbye, kisses her, and, and leaves. And now you've got Ruth, and what a beautiful picture of them just weeping together, and, and she's clinging to her, she's hugging her. Now, look, life is made up of choices, and oftentimes the direction of our life is made up of what seems at the time to be little or insignificant choices. How many of you can look back over the course of your life and there was, a, there was a time where you made a choice and at the time, you didn't think that it had that much gravity to it. You didn't think that it was that big of a deal. But now as you look back at that, you think, man, if I wouldn't have decided to go over there and have lunch, I never would have, you know, ran into this guy, which then opened up this door, which then opened up that door. And that is why the Bible encourages us. Look, you pray about everything. You pray about all of the choices of life. And, and many times we're just making these choices for ourselves and we're not really bathing them in prayer, not understanding how little choices in life can create such big events in our life. So here, here's a young lady and she's just saying to her, one has made the choice, I'm going to go back home. And another one has made the choice, you know, I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to go with her. I love this woman, and I'm going to, I'm going to be with this, this woman. Notice in verse 15, and Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you. Don't, don't beg me to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people, they're going to be my people. And your God, my God. And where you die, I will die. And where you will be buried, and uh, I, I will be buried. And, and the Lord do so to me and more so if anything but death parts you and me. I'm looking at this, and I'm thinking, well, she's committed, isn't she? And, and this, is, this is her commitment. This is her conversion. We might say this is her uh, sinner's prayer. This is Ruth's sinner's prayer. She's, she's saying, hey, I am all in. The God that you worship, that's, that's, my, that's my God from, from here on out. And your people, they are going to be my people from, uh, from here on out. Now, you'll notice that they return uh, to Bethlehem. And, and um, now it's been 10 years, and it has been a difficult 10 years. And so as she comes into Bethlehem, uh, they are saying, is this Naomi? I mean, you ever go to your class reunion and think, do I look that old, right? And, uh, and so here she comes back, right? And they're like, yikes, hey, is this? Now, Naomi, the name means pleasant. So she was probably a good little girl. She probably was a very pleasant looking child. And, and so uh, she comes into town and people are like, you gotta be kidding me. Uh, is this, is this uh, pleasant? And uh, notice that she says, don't call me Naomi. Don't call me pleasant. You call me Mara. Now, Mara is bitter. She is saying, don't call me pleasant. You call me bitter. So here is a woman who ends up now, at, as, she, as she's going to tell us here in verse 21, she comes back, she's empty, right? She doesn't, she doesn't, their, their plan, uh, you know, sell high, buy low, uh, that plan went out the window uh, long ago. And so they are coming back to Bethlehem with absolutely nothing. They are homeless. They are penniless. And she is bitter about this. Now, why did all of this happen? Are they, are they following the instructions of God? Are they following what the Lord told them? No, 
They're, they're leaning upon their own understanding. Hey, I got a great idea, you know, and I'm so smart on all. I think I'm going to follow my uh, great idea. And they crash and they burn. But this is classic, isn't it? Notice in verse 21, she says, now, I went out fall, right? I mean, they cashed in, right? And of course, because they lived in their house so long, they didn't have pay capital gains. And, uh, and so the Lord has brought me home again empty. But why do you call me Naomi? Since the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has afflicted me. Notice also in verse 13 that she says, the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Notice what she says in verse 20, the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. You call me bitter because this is how God has treated me. God, God hasn't treated her like this. You see, what does she say? She's admitting to in verse 21, uh, the Lord has brought me home. The Lord has brought me home. How many people do you know who have gone through long seasons of backsliding, long seasons of rebelling against God? They have trashed their marriage. They've trashed their relationship with their kids. They have trashed their savings. They have ended up being penniless, and yet the Lord brings them back to himself. They have lost everything, but God has brought them back home again. It's not that God was dealing with them bitterly. It's not that God was the one causing all of this to happen. It was their choices. It was their decisions that they were putting themselves through. God is gracious and God is merciful at any moment. As we find ourselves up to our eyeballs in compromise, at any moment I can turn and I can receive the great mercy and forgiveness of God. At any moment I can receive that. God is ready to welcome back home an erring child. God is not mean. God is not bitter. God is willing to forgive, and he is willing to give us a do-over and to begin to work in our lives again. We get ourselves in trouble we make a series of poor decisions, and then we blame God uh, for the outcome. And what we're going to see is that even though they end up penniless, even though they are homeless, God is going to begin to work, and God is going to begin to provide, and God is going to begin to build something so magnificent that neither of these two women are going to be able to wrap their minds around what God is able to do. God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above anything that we might ever ask or think. And maybe you have trashed a lot of things in your life. Maybe you have burned a lot of bridges. Maybe you have ruined a lot of relationships. You serve a God who is rich in mercy and you serve a God who is able to restore the years that the canker worm and the locusts have eaten if we will but turn to him oh God please forgive me oh God please restore me restore the joy that I had with you restore unto me the relationship that I had with you and over and over again our God will do that and so what makes chapter 2 and 3 and 4 so exciting is that it is the restorative work of what our God does and through it all he gives us one of the most beautiful Beautiful pictures of the Messiah and the church that in between the ruin of the book of Judges and the kingdom we have the kinsman redeemer who comes and restores and we have got the first Adam in the garden ruining everything but oh we've got the second Adam on his way and we've got the second Adam who will establish the kingdom. But in between, we have got the second Adam who died and rose again. And he has given the likes of us a relationship now with the king. Oh, what a savior we have.
So I think that as we go to prayer tonight, we need to be praying uh, that the Lord would help us to be very sensitive to those temptations that would lead us in a direction of compromise and that we would understand that these choices, these decisions that we make in life, we need to be bathing these things in prayer, asking, hey, not my will, but your will be done. Father, we, we thank you, Lord, for your great love. We thank you that you are faithful. Lord, how blessed we are that even when we are without faith, you remain faithful because you cannot deny who you are. You are the faithful God. And so, Lord, I would ask that you would so work in each of our hearts that, that we would be faithful to you. Lord, this week, help us to continue to make the choices of life an issue of prayer Lord, help us to understand that we have been placed here to do your will and not our own. Lord, would you highlight for us when we are drifting and we are going into these places of compromise. And Father, I would ask that if we've got anybody here tonight and they have, they have been far from you for a long period of time, Lord, would you fill them with hope would they be found turning to you and allowing you to restore them by your great grace? Father, I thank you that this room is filled with so many people that we were living just such foolish lives. And yet, God, you had great mercy on us. Oh, Father, how we thank you for your tender love. Help us now, Lord, to love one another with that love as well. For we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen.